Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am super excited um, to be sharing space with you all. Um, right now, um, I feel like we just have to name that um, there are so many events that have ooh, happened in the past few days, the past month, the past year, um, and that uh, some of these events are heartbreaking. Some of them have been deeply inspiring. And um, some of them I'm sure we haven't really made sense of yet. Um, but here's what I do know about these moments of rupture and confusion and excitement is that uh, there's always a need to ground, uh, to reflect and to assess. And that is what we are here to do uh, today. Um, as we do the work of imagining um, and calling forth a new world, uh, and we need to talk about our democracy that we're trying to create together, and of course, what is happening in Georgia. And that is, that is the thing we're going to dig into today. So we have folks from Georgia, D.C., Virginia, North Carolina, and Wisconsin, and Maryland um, that are joining us today, which is super exciting. Um, but before we get going, uh, let's just get, uh, let's do that grounding work. Um, so uh, Reverend Duncan Teague from uh, the, the Minister at Abundant Love Unitarian Universalist Congregation of, um, in Atlanta is going to join us and share some words um, for this moment. So the Reverend Duncan Teague, if you want to unmute and share Good your Good morning. Words. Um, or it's, it's afternoon, it's, it's time for brunch now. Um, for <laughs> that sacred brunch, um, for many of us today is a day when we uh, do something religious, not all of us, but many of us. Um, and, and, and that's at least the tradition I came out of. I'm Unitarian Universalist, proud to be, but I tried to wash out the Baptist and I couldn't. 
Um, so Sunday is a day when I feel like I need to do something sacred. And um, I know that this conversation will take us into many areas of our political life, our movement life, what's important to our hearts, our dreams, our uh, work, our struggles, what for many of us is painful. And um, I want to say out loud that in honor of Fannie Lou Hamer, we are doing holy work. We're doing political work. We're doing social change work. We're doing struggle. We're going to jail. We're in the street. Some of us are not in, in jail and in the street. Some of us are at home trying to protect our loved ones from a pandemic and being supportive in ways that we can. Um, and we're negotiating that with our partners, with our children, with the people we love and care about. I gotta go do this march, y'all. <laughs> okay, so I'll wear the right thing. I'll do the right thing, but I have to go do this piece. And I think that drive to do it, the reason we would not go take that good job paying so much more <laughs> is because this is holy and sacred work. And it's about bringing us to the places where we dream about. And I, I feel like that's my job as a, a spiritual leader. Um, and that some of us feel caught because we were growing hopeful, moving toward what's next. How do we plan this out so that we can get more people to plug in or plug in in a different way or whatever from our transition to saying goodbye to Mr. Floyd, supporting whatever was going on in Minneapolis, supporting what was going on in our own communities. And then here in Georgia, on election day, they pulled the same stunts that they pulled during our gubernatorial election. Didn't even bother to re to do it better, the same exact stunts. And yet we have to hold on to something bigger, even as we see folks in line for two and three hours to vote, which is not necessary. It ain't right. And we know it ain't right. And before we can get our strategy down to get the electric plugs put back on the machines, that's my goal, y'all is to make sure that all the stupid machines, and I don't like the word stupid, but I can't say the word I wanna say, because Nicole is representing the UUA. You know, we're trying to be nice. Um, I just want the plugs on the machine. Now, if you've hacked them, that's another story, but can you put a plug on the machine? That ain't asking too much. Before I could get my strategy in mind for that, Two of our officers do not know how to handle a man who is intoxicated in line at Wendy's. Because maybe they shouldn't be doing that in the first place. And it would be horrendous if he were in the hospital beat up. It would be horrendous if he were hanging on to his life and it turns out that he also had COVID but he's gone. So in the midst of our sacred word, yeah, our sacred word, and our sacred work, we got to stop and say no more. So much from all sides. Um, so the work you're doing is uh, profound. And thank you for taking out a moment on a Sunday to do it from wherever you come from, from wherever you're doing, and that your breath is sacred, mm. that your contribution to this is 
historical and profound. And thank you. And that's, that's where I want to set us off so that when we get to that loving, that place where all our breath is recognized, especially, and I make it personal, my black life matters. Hmm. Even when I'm not dressed like a minister. And I also have to say out loud, when my trans siblings are involved in this work, mm, can their lives matter while we're trying to set everybody free? That's how sacred it is. Down to the, the trans Black woman standing to my side who made it possible for me to be in the streets as a Black queen. Uh-oh, I'm going to start preaching, Nicole. Um, I love y'all. I thank you for what you do. I used to be with Georgia Equality back when we could celebrate, because I, I got the privilege of riding in on top of uh, queer marriage. And uh, somebody said to start preaching. Well, I, you know what? You can send a donation to Abundant Love. Hallelujah. <laughs> And we also worship now on Zoom, like everybody else. You can find our information on the uh, Facebook page. We are www.abundantluv.org. And um, Nicole, you are sweet to have your minister come on here for this moment on a Sunday and do this. Um, please take care of yourselves also. If you're saving lives, you save your own first. Thank you. Um, that includes you, Nicole. Um, and, and thank you for the work you're doing and, and for the history that must be changed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Teague. Um, and um, <laughs> felt you know, a little called out there, but um, it's really moments like these um, to be engaged in really, really important work um, in my Unitarian Universalist family in uh, Zoom webinars like this with just brilliant, brilliant minds and beautiful hearts um, that are joining us um, on this call today. Uh, just to give all of our participants a little idea on how this thing is gonna go, um, we're going to be talking with our partners, uh, Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights and New Georgia Project, about what happened on Tuesday, <laughs> June 9th. What does that mean uh, for democracy in our elections in, in Georgia? And uh, what is the, the work that we have to do um, ahead? So I wanna like kick us off and introduce you um, and there'll be a brief uh, Q&A um, from the wonderful folks who had, um, who submitted their questions. So we'll go into that and then we'll kick it to um, some of our You the Vote faves, um, Paige Ingram and Nora Rassman uh, to really dig into uh, the, the work of our faith in this moment. Um, but right now I will kick it to Brandon Brown who is the Deputy Field Director at New Georgia Project uh, to get his take. So welcome, Brandon. Hey, thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you, Reverend Duncan. That was amazing. Um, I think you hit it right on the head. We have so much work to do um, with all the organizations here and all the good work that we are doing. It's, it's great in this moment, but at the same time, there's just so much more left that we need to do, especially right now. Um, again, my name is Brandon Brown. I'm from the New Georgia Project. I am the Deputy Field Director. And so uh, primarily what we do at the New Georgia Project, we are all about voter registration and voter mobilization. So we focus primarily on getting people registered to vote and then getting people active and participating in the voting process. Um, as everybody I'm sure knows now by this point, Tuesday with our primary election, it was a mess. I mean, there's no other way around it. There were so many issues from literally from 7 a.m. until 1 a.m. in the morning with different voting precincts and 
people not being able to vote, um, long wait lines of people up and up into five, six, seven hours waiting in line, um, people receiving the wrong information, polls closing without notice. There's like any issue that you can think of, you can name it, it happened on Tuesday. And so these were some of the things that we were trying to address on the front lines in that moment on Tuesday. Um, I can tell you personally, I started receiving calls at about 5.30 in the morning of just stuff going on. And I'm going to say stuff um, going on because like people weren't prepared. The state wasn't prepared for elections. Um, people weren't trained correctly on how to use the machines or how to set them up. There's just a literally a list, a myriad of just different issues that we experienced Tuesday. Um, so some of the things that we did while talking to voters and while doing election protection on Tuesday was making sure that uh, while people waited in these long lines, these ridiculous lines, um, that they had food, they had water, they had chairs, they had the simple things to kind of keep them in line and keep them engaged um, in order to make sure that they actually cast their vote. And so the biggest thing that we want to do is make sure that one, everybody's voice is heard because that's the biggest thing when it comes to voting. We don't want to make sure that people experience voter suppression as we have in the past um, in the state of Georgia. Uh, we want to make sure that people that do come out and do turn out, they do have the ability and they do have the opportunity to actually submit their vote. Um, some of the other things that we did, we had entertainment rolling around from different locations to keep people just upbeat and keep their spirits high while all of this voter suppression is going on. Um, so, I mean, I personally was out around the state um, talking to voters, collecting stories, uh, putting water on trucks and making sure that people had fresh water while waiting out in the rain or waiting out in the hot sun, making sure people had ponchos, all of just different good stuff that um, the state wasn't prepared for. And so some of the things that we're trying to do as we move forward as an organization is one, continue with our lawsuit um, against the Secretary of State. And so we've collected over a hundred different stories about um, issues of voter suppression that uh, people have been experiencing, especially on Tuesday. And so what we're looking for is anyone else that um, experienced voter suppression or experienced long wait times or experienced anything that uh, had issues to do with voting, not receiving an absentee ballot, uh, applying for one and never getting uh, returned back, uh, receiving it late, receiving it after the election, that sort of stuff, those are the stories that we're trying to collect to make sure that while we continue to work through our lawsuit, we're able to advocate on behalf of Georgians. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we do is to continue to make sure that your, voice, your voices are amplified and heard as we continue to talk about voting specifically in Georgia and making sure everybody has access to vote. Um, I mean, we saw 1.8 million people come out to vote and the last voter didn't cast their vote until about 1 a.m. So that's a problem. Like, that's something that we just can't have happen again. And so we're trying to push to make sure that a lot of the protections that we put in place and a lot of the things that we're fighting for and advocating for, that this doesn't happen in November. And especially with runoffs coming up in August, we want to make sure that we do our best to make sure that this doesn't happen in runoffs either. Because with these runoffs coming up, specifically with uh, your DAs, your district attorneys, these are people who are gonna be advocating and gonna be fixing some of the issues and hopefully have the solutions to the problems that we're experiencing right now, especially when it comes to uh, black lives and police brutality and these sort of issues. So we're trying to make sure that people understand how all of these programs and how all of these elections and things are connected and intertwined. And so we do a lot of education as well. Um, I know we're going to get into some very specific questions a little bit later, so I don't want to continue to harp on and get into the rabbit hole of everything, but um, the biggest thing, if anyone does have any stories, feel free to reach out to me. I will drop my information as well as the link in the chat, and we would love to advocate on behalf of you and figure out what we can do to fix this. All right, uh, Brandon, Ooh, thank you so much, and a lot of that information, I mean, I, I was one of those people I had been working way too much and um, went to the polls on Tuesday and waited in line for three hours. Um, and I got there really at the 
right? Right when, right when the polls were, you know, about to close and there were 20 people behind me. Um, but by the time I voted, there were four people behind me. Um, so there's definitely right work to do to make sure that we're protecting um, our right to vote. And also like, it's just some beautiful work that folks did to just really resource the people in line to be able to stay um, and, and endure that, uh, which is obviously incredibly unfair. So thank, thank you um, and thank New Georgia Project for doing the work um, that you do. Um, I want to, to switch it over to our other partner, Georgia uh, Latino Alliance for Human Rights, who we have been working with and making calls to Cobb County voters um, around the sheriff's race. Um, in Cobb County because we know that there are many ways that our communities are stripped of agency um, that uh, really starts chipping away um, at the democracy that we want to build. So I am really excited um, and humbled to announce that we have Adelina from GLAR on the call. Um, Ade, uh, let us know what your take is. Thank you, Nicole. Um, hi, my name is Adelina Nichols. I am the executive director of the Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights. And before uh, Brandon goes away, um, I have a couple of stories that I will be connecting later on. I think it's very important as we collectively uh, push back all this border suppression. Um, the Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights is a grassroots a, a organization that uh, we have been working on the ground for more than 15 years, uh, paying attention of uh, and issues of um, racial profiling, arrests, detentions, deportations for many years. And since 2018, we saw the opportunity to to add another strategy to our work. And this is the electoral strategy, combining, combining the traditional methods of uh, civic engagement with grassroots organizing. Um, as a Reverend Duncan uh, mentioned uh, before, the, uh, we have this bad experience in 2018 uh, with the uh, elections of the uh, candidate um, Stacey Abrams, where many of us saw many of the issues that we have seen uh, now in this uh, June 9 pr primary election. And we, uh, in many ways, I thought in this, uh, for this uh, election period to put more attention to those uh, elements that are perpetuating uh, mass incarceration, mass detention, police brutality, and, a, and look for another opportunities to, to work together in a different level in this part, in this strategy, kind of the electoral strategy. Uh, at the same time that we can mobilize, that we can do uh, events, direct actions, uh, I think the, uh, the electoral process has been very important. And now that the, um, uh, the minority groups are, the faces of Georgia are different. Uh, they are merging different uh, uh, and other actors, uh, more Latinos, Asians, uh, that we see in the, every single day here in the state of Georgia. Um, part of the strategy as well was to target uh, a 287G programs. Uh, the 287G, of course, is the, uh, has been only um, accepted in counties. Uh, by the power of the sheriff. Uh, therefore, our efforts as a 51C3 was more into civic engagement, getting out to vote against 287G, trying to push back all these uh, a, a tactics that had been arresting and uh, processing uh, Latinos as well uh, for deportation, but also the ramp to a way to stop the racial profiling. In, 2000, in, um, in, Ju in June 9, uh, we were able to witness, as Brandon mentioned, uh, there was a complete mess statewide, mostly in the metro Atlanta area uh, counties. But the thing here, I think it, it is a mess in terms of how the, uh, it, the 
the techniques that they are using uh, for border suppression, you know, are exactly the same and moving in the same direction from the other people that doesn't believe that uh, we need a change. Um, but also, what uh, we were able to witness uh, is the amount of people that got out to vote. That's another uh, a, a counterpart that allow us to, uh, to see how much is the interest of different communities, minorities, uh, uh, to get out and do um, make a change. Um, I can tell you that, uh, for example, I believe that um, in 2016, more than uh, 30,000 people went out to vote this time, more than 78,000 people went out to vote in Cobb County. So I think it's a combination of the merging powers, the momentum that Black Lives Matter as well put it on the table like an open, you know, see what is going on and all of us are being affected. We need to do something, we need to change something, not only March, not only, uh, you know, I speak and go to the commissioners or do rallies or, or post stuff in the, in the Facebook, but also, you know, we need to add this, get out and uh, push back all these uh, elected officials that they are uh, not concerned about the needs of their own uh, constituency. And I think that it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, show of uh, the determination of people uh, uh, being in line for more than four hours and a half, showing up, waiting, uh, uh, looking a way to, to vote that day. Um, uh, and also for us, uh, uh, even though we don't know at this time how many Latinos went out, uh, but I think that um, uh, it was an increase as well. Uh, of people wanting change against the uh, 287G policies, against police brutality, against racial profiling, against all these uh, a, a, a police enforcement that we are fed up of, of being always profiled when we are driving around the streets. For us as the grassroots, uh, mostly undocumented community, uh, has been our, are the main subjects of this change. Um, even uh, because at the end, uh, uh, our communities as well are, very, are uh, the impact ones by these federal and local policies, not only from coming in for deportations uh, coming from the federal, but also by the uh, HB, um, uh, SB 350 that penalized Latinos for driving or undocumented community for driving without a license. That has been devastated, plus the 287G programs that are being uh, implemented in Cobb, Gwinnett, and another three counties around the, uh, around the, um, the state. So uh, for us, uh, I think it's, uh, it's an opportunity. Uh, we still have to face the runoff, we have to win in November, we have to make a uh, change, but um, this is the beauty of combining uh, all the forces uh, in, the be and in looking to have like a collective benefit. Uh, and I think that we need to push harder, and uh, we need to continue uh, working as a block. Uh, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter where are you from, we need to continue uh, working as a block. Uh, Nicole, I don't know if I still have time or that's it. Um, that's it for now and then we'll go, we'll, we'll dig in some more in the Q&A. Thank you, Adelina. Um, and thank you for just reminding us. Sometimes we see these, you know, really horrible scenes and really, you know, frustrating events um, and just reminding us that, yeah, while we saw you know, the images coming out of, you know, those long lines at the polls. Um, we also saw like robust voter turnout, right? So like the, the tides, right, are changing. And, um, you know, we've been, our, our Georgia team has been making calls um, about 387G to voters in Cobb County. And it's not just, right, folks really feeling empowered to call forth a new world through, through the act of voting, but they're co going there and bringing, right, their values of uh, their believing in the inherent worth and dignity of all and saying, not only am I going to vote, but I am voting 
for something. Um, the voters that we, we talked to were seeing that, no, they, they actually did not support, right, these policies, right? And um, especially now during a pandemic, right, we've seen that folks are really, really rethinking our carceral system um, right now. And so while we see um, these devastating images, it's always important to, to note uh, the things that are going well and the hope that we have to really uh, defeat hate in this election. Um, yeah. With that, I want to um, kick it over to Shannon Clausen from um, Georgia Equality, which has been one of those stalwart organizations that has uh, been, been fighting hate um, through advocacy and, and mobilization here in Georgia. So uh, Shannon, I will kick it to you. Hi, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, sorry, I was a little late. I came in right at the tail end of Brandon's um, kind of description of Tuesday. So I'm going to trust that he covered the highlights. Um, but what I do want to, and, and we partnered actually with New Georgia Project all day to help deliver water and food and um, saw a lot of the same things I'm sure he talked about. Um, to talk a little bit about Georgia Equality and what I do, um, I'm the state outreach manager for Georgia Equality, and Georgia Equality has a full portfolio of work. We, we basically try to get involved in anything that impacts an LGBT person's life, which is like everything, because they're whole people. And so um, we do, we work on Medicaid expansion, we work on adoption and family law, we do, do a lot of um, issue advocacy down at the Capitol. We do... Um, we will endorse state-based candidates through our non-partisan, our, our non, um, our C4 partisan arm, which is a smaller part of our organization. We do a lot of civic education and um, voter registration work. And so we, while we have kind of a diverse things that we work on, um, I was originally brought on to the organization to run our voter registration program in 2018, which was very much like jumping into the deep end of the pool. Uh, but uh, uh, baptism by fire and, you know, good to <laughs> learn a lot quickly, right? Um, and so I've been really proud of our voter registration program and, you know, had a whole plan set up for this year. We were going to knock it out of the park and then COVID-19 happened. And so um, what I've, we've spent the last three months doing is really trying to be creative and reinvent the way that we do voter registration. For those of you that don't know, um, phone banking, all, all these organizations that are doing phone banking and text banking and all that kind of stuff, 90% of the time those numbers come from the voter action network, the, the van. And that van is um, a list of registered voters, right? So if we're trying to register people to vote, the list that we're typically calling and phone banking for issue advocacy or for um, GOTV work, those people already all should be registered. And so we're trying to get really, really creative of like, how can we reach people digitally through friends and family phone banks, through, um, uh, you know, organize or uh, uh, relational organizing apps, um, all that kind of stuff. And so I, I'm really excited. We actually do have a lot of plans that we're working on um, in order to utilize social media, utilize relationships with local businesses, um, and um, try try and get people registered through online, which is something that Georgia has been moving, wanting to move towards for a long time. Like doing paper ballot, like paper, uh, not paper ballots, but doing paper voter registration is a really big lift for advocacy organizations. Um, it's, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of money, um, a lot of things go into quality control and that kind of stuff. And so um, we would like eventually to move to a completely online system. But we can't do that until people can register to vote online with just their social security number. Because right now you can only register to vote online with your driver's license or state ID. And um, that, you know, that, that's, that is a barrier to voting. That is voter suppression. Um, but because these paper versions exist, um, people still have one way to be able to register with just their social security number. But it's way more complicated and difficult than if you have a driver's license. So um, so that's where we are, and that's kind of what we are working on right now. We do have a regular Tuesday night 
um, volunteer night where we voter registration GOTV is a very, very big part of that. Um, so I definitely encourage everybody to join us for that. Um, and you know, there, there, there's a question, list of questions that Nicole had asked us to share. Um, one of them being, you know, how do you see direct action and protest movements as a part of the electoral process or the practice of democracy? I mean, it is essential, right? Being able to protest, speak truth to power, make a statement, get the media there, wake people up is so essential, but it's only the first step. And that's something that I think a lot of people are feeling right now with this weekend's murder of Richard. Um, I think a lot of people thought we were going in a better direction, you know, and, and of course, um, I think the people in this room know that it, this is a long work. This takes a long time um, to work on and a long time to make change. And so, you know, having a national conversation about police brutality isn't enough because the same stuff is still happening. Um, right at the height of all this unrest, we're still seeing the exact same stuff that we're protesting. And so I think um, the the best thing that I think engaged voters can do is to, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now. Oh, is it the Secretary of State? Oh, is it the counties? Yes, and all of the above. Like get involved in your local county board of election, go to their meetings. Um, I think New Georgia Project has a great program called the Peanut Gallery, right? Like get involved in going to, um, you know, the meetings, write the letters, um, you know, in addition to, led, you know, lobbying and advocating for legislation at the Capitol um, that will address voter suppression. Um, in addition to, you know, rights to the polls and dropping off water on election day, right? Because like the goal is, is that they don't need to have rights to polls and they don't need water to stand in line, right? Voting should be super easy. Um, somebody asked a question about vote by mail and um, absolutely Georgia Equality um, is very committed to supporting vote by mail um, here in Georgia. We mailed out um, about a, a thousand, just under a thousand absentee applications um, for people that never received an application so couldn't even request their ballot. Um, Brandon gave a really great answer around the concern around exact match. Um, I know that due to the 2018 lawsuits, um, the what they can do and the penalties for exact match are around are definitely lessened. And so we're working on like eroding and chipping away at like the power of exact match. Um, and then making sure, you know, I was so inspired on Tuesday. Not inspired so not work, encouraged. I was really encouraged because I was also out there on the lines in 2018. And I did not, like, I didn't think that Georgia could manage to do a worse job than they did in 2018. And that was my number one thing on Wednesday morning of like, I didn't think they had it in them that they could go above and beyond 2018. Um, but the difference was, is in 2018, people were giving up, were frustrated. I mean, had to go to work, had to, you know, were, I felt like they felt like the system had all the cards and not worth it. Whereas, on this Tuesday, I very much felt the, I'll wait, got nowhere to be. And part of that is because of COVID, but I think also part of it is that people understood that like there were sheriffs on this ballot, there were DAs on this ballot, there were, you know, judges on this ballot. I think people were connecting the dots of what was happening in the streets and what was happening at the polls. And that was really encouraging to me because they weren't, you know, I had a woman call me in tears because she was trying to get her vote counted and there was a problem with her ballot. And like, at she like we ended up getting the poll manager on the phone and we worked it all out, but it was because she calls me in tears and like was pushing so hard to get her vote counted. She was literally just saying to the poll manager, I just wanna make sure my vote counts, right? Which to me, I'm just like, we are gonna be all right, right? Like if people are carrying this much and pushing that hard, um, you know, I think people are understanding. I think in 2018, there was a lot of 
doesn't matter, like my vote doesn't count, all the cards stacked against us, which like accurate and fair, I'm not gonna argue with that. But I think um, this time people were, are very much like, the cards are stacked against us and they're trying to make sure my vote doesn't count and I'll be damned if they try to take away my vote right now. Um, so that's what's inspiring to me. That's kind of what's keeping my going. Um, so the next steps are our org getting involved every Tuesday night. We have a volunteer night. Sometimes like this night, it's going to be a leadership training this Tuesday. Um, and then the next Tuesday after that, it's going to be get out the count work, but then we're going to go right back into, um, uh, voter registration work, um, and doing digital voter registration work, digital organizing, friends and family, um, phone banking, really looking specifically at, at low voter turnout numbers. A lot of times in the past, people, campaigns only focus on high turnout. Like if you have a, it's called the 70%, 70% propensity and higher, that's who we, uh, to turn out and vote, that's who we target to make sure they go vote. Now, because of COVID-19, it's like, well, nobody ever contacts the people that are like 50 to 30% likely to go vote. Let's, let's work on those people and then get them to talk to their friends. So that's kind of some of the creative workarounds that we're trying to um, to do right now. And I'm really excited to, um, yeah, be a part of this group and thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and, uh, I just want to, uh, quickly know, I know you said, you know, you're doing the get out, uh, the count work and that is around the, the census, right. And making sure folks fill that out. Um, which we know that our, our democracy, right, um, or what we're trying to make into a democracy, um, means that, right, every voice uh, has to, to be counted to actually have a system of accountability um, in, in our government, right? Like that's what it is set up for. Um, that act of voting uh, d really solidifies a relationship, right? That says like, hey, you are, you align maybe the, you're the, the closest in alignment to my, my politics and my values, right? And I am going to empower you to be a part of a system that is making these decisions. However, one day after election day, one week after election day, six months after election day, I'm gonna be, right? right. Yeah, I'm like we talk about on like the ladder of civic engagement or the ramp of civic, like voting's the floor, the ground level. Voting is like the, good job you showed up as your like as a citizen right you know and then we everything comes after that community organizing or digital digital organizing and volunteering and community organizing all this kind of stuff but like voting is the bare minimum this is where we start and then we have to take it into the capital and the city council chambers and the you know all that stuff yes um absolutely and we see what happens when we either depress uh voter turnout or through other mechanisms um, people are not being held accountable to the, the people that they represent, right? We get institutions uh, that don't align with our values. And with that, I want to shift um, into a quick Q&A. A lot of folks, when they signed up for this webinar, um, submitted some questions, and I want to dig into that. And um, one of those questions, right, is about accountability and the, the institutions that we find when we don't have a really um, representative government that is accountable to folks. And um, someone asked, um, now that we've had, you know, our sheriff elections um, around, you know, and, and talked to voters around 287G, um, what is the next step um, to be working towards decarceration? Um, and that is for you, Ade. Sorry, Kiss. I think that we haven't finished in terms of the sheriff's um, um, elections uh, we still have a runoff and just to make sure that uh, based on the demands demands that we have already put it out uh, that talks about like uh, cash bail uh, safety and security at jails um, a, of course ending to 87g uh, we and um, a, and, and other um, demands a, the thing here is for us that we sh should continue pushing. I think that uh, in particular, the sheriffs uh, has been almost in the same positions uh, more than 25 to 30 years already. 
I think that they, we need to renew people, to change, to, uh, to look for the collective demands and, and, um, and push for the uh, commitments that uh, they have, do they have uh, done with us uh, in terms of uh, ending the issues that we have with this uh, mass incarceration of Latinos or communities of color. And of course, another issue from Song, uh, which is Southern, Southern is on new ground, another of our partners is the, the importance of cash bail, uh, to end cash bail, to uh, end uh, exactly that uh, people being in jail because they don't, do not have money to pay. So uh, this is just the beginning, uh, Nicole. Uh, we will continue. We will be out moving the runoff, but as well ready for the November elections. And um, it's a lot still uh, work to do. This is just a sheriff, but I think in the bigger picture that will help as well many other communities uh, that um, are uh, being impacted by this um, uh, police brutality and detentions as well. All right. Um, okay. And our the next question uh, we had was um, we are we're living with the decisions and actions that happened before uh, 2020, which I think many of you already talked about. Um, but what are the opportunities that we have today to combat voter suppression, and what must we also do to safeguard um, our elections? Uh, deep into the future. Um, so Brandon, if you want to to take that one. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the biggest thing, honestly, to combat voter suppression is to participate, to volunteer. Um, so the more active that we get in the volunteer process when it comes to uh, working on elections, getting people involved year round, talking to elected officials, making sure that these things just don't happen again, um, the better. So like the more engaged that we have our citizens, the more educated they are, the more that they know about the voting process and how exactly it's supposed to work. Um, those are like some of the best tools that we can use to combat voter suppression. Of course, when we talk about voting, vote them out. Like at the end of the day, like vote them out. So we get people that represent our best interests and people that are going to make sure that people have access to voting. Things like programs that we want to see like automatic voter registration. Um, things where we talk about uh, like online voting or making voting a lot easier and like reducing the barrier of access to voting, like getting rid of exact match, all of that comes from people that are elected or appointed. So the more that we can do to empower people and to educate people about how these decisions are made, the better we become as a state and as including people in the voting process. Um, so we try to reach people to get them involved in the political process through a couple of different ways. Um, we do phone banking, we do text banking, like all the traditional stuff, but we also try to reach people where they're at. Um, so we've like, we're working on building a video game. Um, like we've done like, right, like I appreciate that. <laughs> so like we, um, before Corona hit, we were working on doing, um, the, uh, big like escape room that like talks about like how, uh, like people tried to vote and like doing like voting tests and that sort of thing. So we try to do like non-traditional things to reach people who traditionally aren't in the voting process. Um, just last week, uh, Inse, our executive director, was actually on Twitch, um, which is a gaming streaming channel, and talked to about like 8,000 people about voting, and, like talking about gaming and voting and that sort of thing. So, right, like TikTok, I see stuff like that coming across. So it's like, how do we reach like your average person, your everyday person that may not be as politically involved as we all are, and we know how this process works, but like still talk to them about the issues, but still have a good time while doing it. So um, bringing all of that into the fold are like some of the ways that we're trying to combat voter suppression and just get people involved. Can I also add to that, that the, because you're talking, Brandon, we're making a really good point about like getting the right people in office, but don't assume that your right person is already in office. Like Fulton County is completely democratically controlled, right? So mm -hmm. just because you have this, they have the same party as you does not mean that they have your best interest at heart, right? Like if you look at gerrymandering, that mm -hmm. was a democratic path. And I know this is a, a nonpartisan space and I'm sure that we have right. <laughs> people on, on the thing, but I'm just, as an example, um, you know, there are um, the gerrymandering Senate bill 
like that on our democratic ballot there was a question about like should we have an independent commission and yet no senate state senators were co-sponsoring elena parents bill right they, they didn't want to touch gerrymandering with a 10-foot pole they stayed mm -hmm. far away from it right democratic senators were staying away from it mm -hmm. but like when you're talking about like we got to make sure our elected officials are accountable and get the right people in that is not necessarily a party question and you have to be following up on the people even though they have the same party affiliation as you do yep completely agree like it's it's not like for our call purposes like you said it's not about the party it's about the right person and so you have to know who you're voting for you have to know where they stand on the issues and when they don't stand on those issues you have to call them out and so that's that's a lot of like the things we do and we try to hold people accountable um we also have a c4 arm that does all that good stuff but i won't get into it here but um like hold them accountable call them out when they aren't doing what they're supposed to do um Yes, a amen to all that. And like, yes, uh, we are obviously a nonpartisan um, effort, but um, the truth is also nonpartisan, right? Like, we, <laughs> we, we have to say, like, here's who these people are. Um, and here's the work that they have been doing. Do you align yourself with what they've done? Right? And that is completely nonpartisan. That is why how we hold folks accountable. And I just want to say I'm like, post COVID, I don't know, we have more folks from a lot of different states on the call. Um, escape rooms in Georgia are like a whole thing. And that, um, that is so creative. I'm obsessed it's with that coming. idea. Obsessed. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> the like, we were upset, we were upset. In Georgia. We were upset about Corona with that one, but you know, it's coming, it's coming. We figure it out, like you said, we meet, we meet people where they are. And what I loved about um, kind of what uh, Brandon and Shannon, what you're kind of jamming on is like meeting people where they are and that it really starts with having meaningful conversations. Um, and one of the questions that we had for um, you is someone said, I'm concerned about um, the hateful, po hateful policies um, in general. And is there a legislation, this is specific to Georgia, that is moving that we can mobilize around and what can we expect um during legislative session that's for you shannon so. okay cool um yeah so there is so hb 426 is um a law that was conceived of a couple well conceived of many years ago got actual traction last year and then um and it's a hate crimes bill so it's a bill that would um, create a registry and require police departments to report on hate crimes because we're not required to report on hate crimes here in Georgia. And so if you look up our FBI statistics for number of hate crimes, Georgia it says zero. Now I love Georgia, but I am not so can, you know, so in love with Georgia as to believe that for one hot second, right? Um, and the, so the issue is that we're not reporting. So that's like the number one for me for HB uh, 426, the hate crimes bill. Um, the most important part of that is that we will create a registry. It is not perfect. Um, and, and so there are issues with it. Um, it is um, endorsed and being pushed and moved forward by the, Demo by the, the, by the Black Caucus here in Georgia and we are moving forward with it but I want to be really clear that it is the first step and that the NAACP is coming right behind us with like great cool we did that now let's get rid of you know mandatory minimums let's get over you know that let's let's they have a suite of bills right after that but they you know in divestment and um, reforms that they want to see immediately and so um, that is going to be the push so we are pushing right now for HB 426 to get a hate crimes bill passed because really what happened is that was the that that was a bill that when we lost um Ahmad to that horrific murder that horrific lynching um this bill was already there and it was almost to the finish line and so people really focused on it and were like okay we can move this bill forward we can get this done right now but it's just the first step and so I just want to be really clear about that um there's also a bill that's been introduced called HB 6 36 that we're trying to get a hearing for that would create a registry for all um, use uh, excessive use of force anytime that police force is used um, they, it goes into a registry that is publicly available 
Um, so those are some of the things that we are working on um, as far as legislation. I do want to encourage anybody that is in the Atlanta area, there will be a march and feels comfortable going outside and with all the COVID risks. There is a march at 9 a.m. Um, tomorrow um, run by the NAACP for criminal justice reform. Um, so, so we have the hate crimes. We're pushing really, really hard to get that passed. We have to stay on that um, to get that passed and, and are really hopeful that we can um, get that done in the next 15 or so days. Um, but then also, I wanna say know your rights. Like we have, so like we work with um, trans folk um, in our organization and we have like a know your voting rights brochure that's in our like election center on our homepage. Um, and that brochure just kind of says like what you can and can't do. Like that woman who was crying on the phone finally got her vote counted because she knew her rights, right? And so like one of the best things you can do to, um, to combat profiling um, at the booth, like I had a report of a, a woman that has been a citizen for like two decades and had to go home and get her American passport and bring it back because they kept challenging her citizenship at the poll. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's unconscionable. But also she's like, I'm going to go get my passport. I'll be right back, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> like, And so just really um, pushing the poll managers, pushing um, the organizations, making sure that like, there's a lot of things that are done in Georgia that aren't up to code, up to standard, right? And, and like, let's just start like getting the laws being respected as they're currently written. Let's start there and <laughs> try to get some better laws passed. So, um, so that's kind of what we're doing um, around um, instances of, of hate and discrimination um, currently, and we will continue to work beyond this session on that kind of stuff. But definitely encourage you to get involved with our HB 426 campaign. Uh, Nicole, if you allow me to add about in terms of the uh, bills, is the HB 994 is anti-gun bill? Yes, yes, yes. That uh, we are asking community members to make phone calls to their legislators tomorrow uh, against this bill that uh, could cr it will increase the criminalization of our youth, black, brown communities, and I think it's important. Um, this bill is moving really fast. It is kind of the proposal coming down from the uh, governor. So we ask everybody to help us out uh, to stop the HV 994 anti-gang bill. All right. Oh my God, such <laughs> amazing <laughs> information. So glad to be, you know, in, in partnership with you all. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Ade. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, what we have up next is um, some, some reflections and some assessment about what does it mean to be a people of faith um, that are doing this work. So next up, I'm going to pass it to um, Nora Rassman, our Wisconsin State Organizer with UU The Vote. Hi, yes, good afternoon. Um, Yes, really glad to be part of this conversation. Um, so I'm here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and um, work closely with some of the folks on this um, team to figure out what the UU response to this electoral moment means in the context of the uprisings, a global pandemic, and the political possibility that we see. Um, so just kind of like a couple of reactions to this like delicious combo I've been able to sit in on. Um, like, I think there are so many similarities between the ways that voter suppression in Georgia um, happened here in Wisconsin, um, where it's always a tactic when black folks attempt to exert self-determination. Um, and so we know that through the end of the year, we need to be rigorous um, with the ways that we're supporting folks. Um, I think there's also an opportunity to figure out how we're each positioned um, to work on anti-voter suppression work um, and um, had the delicious pleasure of working with Ade closely um, at Hente for Abrams connected to GLAR, um, where we did a lot of the similar things that Brandon has lifted up, where we like go to where people are, which sounds really basic, but it's not something that electoral um, organizations have done historically. So 
where do people gather? And under COVID, that's obviously shifting dramatically, but we have to get creative about going to where folks are um, and then confronting the voting barriers. Um, a couple of things I just want to lift up lessons from Wisconsin that clearly were not applied in Georgia. Um, so Wisconsin was the first primary, it happened April 7th under COVID, um, wherein most other states did cancel um, because of significant concerns. Um, in early March, um, Leaders Igniting Transformation, which is a black and brown youth organizing group, was the first group to call for our Democratic governor to cancel the election for at least a month. Um, he didn't, and um, they consolidated here in Milwaukee what are typically 180 polling locations into five. So a lot of the same stories of people in line for hours and hours. Um, there's at least 40 COVID cases that are directly linked to people coming out um, to vote here in the city, or sorry, the county. Um, and so we don't know what it means statewide. Um, and so I think a lot of the, the tips that have been shared already around how do we consolidate our demands on elected officials around both absentee ballots being mailed um, and like really confronting some of the barriers around exact match and um, other ID requirements, ensuring that when people do come out, because there's so many reasons why people do wanna vote in person and especially older folks, um, they that's really a preference i heard from a lot of people phone banking people <laughs> you know they wanted to, because of the 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 physical and like the, the concern with physical um ballots being thrown away which we know is right on because we've heard stories of the um purges of ballots and so making sure that people have the personal protective equipment to vote safely if they are going to decide um to vote so um, kind of given, given this, this space, I'm, I'm just inviting folks into here in Wisconsin, we're collaborating with Wisdom, which is a statewide faith-based organization that's working on race class narrative work that is figuring out how to weave in this current moment and what it means for how we talk to voters about what's possible both in the August primary and in the November election. Um, we're collaborating with a group called Wisconsin Voices um, to partner with on um, phone and text banking for where our people across the state are positioned to talk to folks. Um, and we're really trying to figure out how to make connections to people who are currently elected and some of the immediate demands. Um, so I would love to point people to a very newly um, created group called Milwaukee Freedom Fund who have been holding down a lot of the immediate demands for our Milwaukee district attorney around some of the criminalization of protesters, um, as well as some um, police brutality um, cases that are still pending that require and can use some, some love and time from folks. Um, so I think kind of how we, how we thread the needle from this political moment, the electoral opportunities, the lessons that we've seen and the failures um, of uh, elected officials across political party to ensure that people can vote safely. Um, there's just huge opportunity. So I think I'm gonna kick it to you, Nicole, unless there's other things you wanted me to talk about. But um, yeah, really grateful to be here with y'all and grateful to be thinking about um, where we where we sit and how we can flex our collective pressure to make November um, be just. Thank you. And there's there's always more that I want to talk to you about, but we will be kind with people's time this Sunday morning, uh, ooh, afternoon. Um, so yeah, and um, because I want to make sure we get out of here on time, let's just immediately go to um, Paige Ingram. Um, with her, her reflections and uh, what she's got cooking. Hey everybody, um, thank you for staying on and holding strong. Um, I'm Paige, I am based in Minneapolis. Maybe you've heard of Minneapolis, I don't know. Like, you know, we're just, we're, we're out here, we're, we're in the news, I, you know, maybe you might've seen some things um and yeah we uh as a city we've kind of found ourselves at the epicenter of um what at this point and i think for a while can be deemed as an uprising um and i use that word very deliberately um some things that i've been reflecting on and thinking about in this in this particular local context is the importance of local elections during this time and like galvanizing people around around 
recognizing that in a different way. Um, our city council voted unanimously to defund our police department. Um, that's not something that the president can do. That's not something that the governor even can do. And so I think I, we, we are in a very unique moment of a re-engagement with the electoral uh, process that may have been a turnoff um, given the, the, the Democratic primary, so on and so forth. So I just wanna lift that up and to be like, yes, you are in the right place. And yes, there is work to do regardless of, of like whoever is occupying these really big seats. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say that, I, that I've been thinking about is what is our duty and responsibility for this political moment that we find ourselves in? And what, in, uh, what that means for me is what can I individually do to keep the momentum going? Um, how can we continue to push uh, to, to, to push for people to continue to engage in this work. Um, what does it look like to be like, yes, I am, I, I am committing to coming to rallies. Yes, I'm committed to like occupying space. Yes, I am committing to physically joining in on the ride. So with that being said, I'm a very action oriented person. Um, there are 49, let me hold up. Let me see this real quick. There are 41 attendees on this call. Can I get five people right now who want to volunteer with Georgia Equality? I'm gonna put the link in the chat box. If you wanna volunteer with Georgia Equality, can you put in the chat box, yes, I'm a volunteer. When we get five for that, we'll move on to the next thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll wait. You don't have to actually, you know, fill out all the forms, but I would love to see some people who are down to actually do this work. Cool, thank you, Jonathan. Hey, Gayla, we need three more. Yeah, Gayla's a wonderful partner. She comes every chance she can get. We're so hey. grateful. Yes. With women voters. And that's the other thing that I hope people, while we're waiting for people, we, got, we need three more people to sign up. Three more people. Um, like this work is so collaborative so if you're getting involved with this like that's one of my favorite things about voter registration work apparently before i got here in years gone by decades past there was a lot of like no that's my voter registration card no that's because it's all grant funded and now with like the pro georgia table and fair fight and new georgia project it's like we all work together and it's a beautiful beautiful thing and so that's one of the best things that i love about voter registration work is like you have literally thousands of people working on this together and it's really cool i love that i'm also going to drop the link that yes yes um i also want to drop the link that that brandon had posted about committing um to telling your story about um i believe it was voter suppression click on it and just make it a point that before before you get up and do your thing today can you can you commit to actually telling a story yes and thank you Ivana. is suppression provisional ballot is suppression like having to go and come back is suppression the cords not being there the i mean all of these things having to check up on your absentee ballot that's all suppression never giving an absentee application suppression so like don't think oh because nobody physically turned me away that wasn't suppression share your story That's right. And then I'm going to drop the link for Glar's volunteer form as well. Um, oh, yeah. Don't worry, Barb. I got you. If you're not in Georgia, hold up one sec. I, I, I got you with an opportunity real quick. So for my, for my people in Georgia and my people that are, oh, Brandon, I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy and paste that into the regular thing. Okay, so for people that are maybe not in Georgia and who are looking to get involved, you, you the vote is looking for volunteers, right? So if we're talking about meeting people where, where they are at, you know where people are at? In front of their computers. And everybody's about to be in front of their computers during, during General Assembly. So if you're down and you wanna hang out with me and Nicole 
and Nora and some other folks, you can go ahead and click that link. We're gonna be having um, a volunteer summit tomorrow. So I don't mean to put people on the spot. However, if I have learned anything about the last three weeks, it is that there is no more fence sitting. Fence sitting for 2020 is no longer a thing. And so whether it means putting in an hour a week or putting in an hour a day or longer, it is critical for us to actually put our money where our mouth is. Maybe not, I'm, I'm kind of anti-capitalist, so let's, let's try again. Can we walk the walk? Can we walk the walk? So I just wanna put that out there and just to say that what Reverend, what Reverend Duncan Teague had said about, um, you know, like kind of developing this, this world that, that we're trying to be in, like we are no longer in a dream phase, we are actually doing it. And so what it, what, but what it will require to sustain itself is long-term commitment. Now, I have a problem with commitment. I'll just, I'm just gonna put that out there. It's not my favorite thing. But can we commit to doing something for the next three months? Can, can we ride out the rest of the summer and put a ring on it with one organization and just say, I'm gonna I'm just like be with my people and see what happens. You're gonna get new friends. Like who doesn't wanna look at Brandon every day? I would love to look at Brandon every day. You know what I mean? So this is my pitch. This is what it means to actually be about it. And um, I just want you to click on one of those links and just commit a little bit of time. And if you come to the volunteer summit tomorrow, uh, you can put in the chat, oh, hey, Paige, I saw you. I saw you yesterday and I'm here today. And that's gonna mean something to me and it's gonna mean something to us. So our, our futures are connected. Um, but we are definitely planted in the present. So let's work together. That's all I got. Um, amen. Yeah. If you, if you want to see, uh, Paige Ingram and a few of us tomorrow at the Volunteer Summit, we would love to see you. Also, what I included in the chat is if you want to see Paige Ingram in the New York Times, <laughs> You can click on that link as well. <laughs> yes, I did it. Um, so <laughs> well, I actually want to introduce um, Lisa, Reverend Lisa. I know a lot of folks are in different places. and They're like, well, I'm in North Carolina. Well, we got something for that. Um, so Reverend Lisa, if you want to tell us what's happening in North Carolina. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, so for anybody who's on the call who's from North Carolina or who wants to um, get involved with us, we have a lot of stuff going on. First of all, grateful for all the learning and centering today. North Carolina has a lot to learn from Georgia. We've been watching Suppressed, having conversations with our local folks, making sure that that, that learning gets, uh, gets transferred over to, to your neighbors. Um, so in North Carolina, we actually have a, a partnership meeting this week, uh, this Thursday, June 18th at five o'clock Eastern with one of our major partners, You Can Vote. So whether you are from North Carolina or outside of the state, you can join that call, go on to uuthevote.org and we're right in the events, our UU The Vote, You Can Vote partnership meeting this Thursday. We're also writing thousands and thousands of postcards with Reclaim Our Vote. So a lot of you have been helping us out. So it's a partnership with the North Carolina NAACP. Um, so you can join them and directly support us through making phone calls, sending texts, or writing postcards with Reclaim Our Vote. Um, and that information, you can, you can get that pretty easily. They're our major GA phone banking partner as well. And I'll just drop my email in the chat. If you are a congregation, or an individual from North Carolina or anywhere around the country wants to get involved with our North Carolina UU The Vote project, you can just email me and I would love to get you all involved. Uh, thanks again for everybody, all that you're doing. Uh, it's just really inspiring and we're trying to hold it down in North Carolina um, and make sure that we're, we're doing our part. All right, thank you, Lisa. Uh, and thank you for everyone on this call. This is fun. Um, before, before we close, um, I want to, you know, we all got an ask for what we need. Um, just to give you some announcements about what's going to be happening with you to vote uh, at General Assembly. Um, Lisa kind of mentioned some of this, 
but with our partners. Oh, I think I'm frozen. Okay, cool. Hey, Nicole. Yeah, so there's this thing that happens when I get really excited, my Zoom likes to fail. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to be all right, uh, as we like to chant in the streets. Um, so at General Assembly, um, we are mobilizing our full power of Unitarian Universalism, every single one of us, to really go all in on democracy and do around the clock phone banking to our friends in Texas before their primary election. So what we started is our GA 100K challenge. We are challenging uh, individuals and our congregations to form a team so that the, you all can do uh, this phone banking at General Assembly and help us reach a goal of 100,000 calls during General Assembly. And that's gonna be done with our new national partners, Reclaim Our Vote. And I cannot tell this story enough. This was a partnership that was created from the ground up. Um, after COVID hit, many of you said, well, what are we gonna do? And y'all went and found Reclaim Our Vote and said, we're sending postcards, we're making calls. And Reclaim Our Vote was like, who are these wild people that are doing the very most? And it was us. <laughs> so we connected with them and said, hey, you know, we, we've got a bunch of Unitarian Universalists that are throwing down, um, fighting voter suppression, right, trying to protect our democracy and agency for those folks who are marginalized and pushed out of this process. Let's do something big and grand together. So I'm super excited about really mobilizing um, the power of our faith to live out our values and do something wonderful uh, in Texas during General Assembly. And of course, we're gonna, we're gonna do it again. So after we do it at General Assembly, we're gonna find the next battle. Um, so I'm super excited about that. Um, I will throw that um, in the chat. Uh, yeah, Lisa's got her postcard, Lisa stays ready. <laughs> but I'm going, I'm gonna find, because it's in one of my menus, throw that in the chat before, uh, we leave. Um, I do want to get uh, everyone that's on this panel to give a quick answer to um, what is your vision for, you know, I'm going to say Georgia for us that are in Georgia, but like what, what is your dream that you want to see um, happen in, in your city, your state um, around this election? So uh, we'll just, we're just going to go popcorn style and believe that thing, this thing will work. So as soon as you've got it, let us know what it is. The question is, what is our vision? Like, yeah. where, where are we going? Yes. Like in, in your, in your heart, it doesn't have to be your organization. It could just be like, this is, this oh, is, what heart. Do. this is why I do the work. I'm going to leave my heart out of it because I'm emotional these days, but <laughs> I'm going to focus specifically on voter registration because that's our voting because that's, you know, kind of the purview. And so for me, the, the place that I want to go is automatic and like automatic and same day registration and, and, and vote by mail, um, entirely vote by mail um, system because that tends to have the highest access and highest rate of turnout for people um that's that's my dream i'll go to a uh, page next um you know i'm in this like abolitionist future kind of vibe right now um because it's seeming pretty present so like i'm trying to see people um like just having a completely different relationship with with power um and sensing their power and i think that that'll manifest in a in a variety of different ways including making sure that um making sure that that their that their rights don't get encroached um either visibly or invisibly i'm gonna pass it to my to my woe 
Nora? Um, yes, I, I hope that this um, changes how people understand ongoing engagement with electeds, particularly people who might be of the democratic persuasion. Um, so we go as hard on them as we have on Republicans. And um, here in Milwaukee, I hope that we blossom a multiracial left who can hold our electeds um, accountable and push forward the abolitionist visions that I think um, we've been lifting up on this call. So, and I'll kick it to Ade. I knew it. <laughs> Um, my vision is that um, at the end of this electoral journey um, to have a change that could um, benefit and uh, dignify all communities um, and and I know this as a first step because I think the vision could need to be broader but uh, I hope that the announcement, uh, that whatever is happening, all that is happening, uh, keep us as a, a united um, fighting for what is right for everybody. Uh, Brandon. Thank you, thank you. Um, I mean, a lot like Ada, my vision is to have a Georgia that's representative of the people. Um, and not so much the controlling interests and the powers that be here. Um, I tell this like quick story about like why I actually came back to Georgia. I grew up here, I'm from here, um, lived in Stone Mountain. We had these same, literally these same potholes for 24 years that were never paved, nobody ever cared about, nobody did anything about it. It took working on the campaign to get somebody elected specifically to fix those potholes. So that's why like, I do this work, not so much for potholes, but for fixing things, like fixing problems that often go unignored unignore, and actually changing things and having real results. Like that's something personal that just annoyed me and that's why I came back to do this. So I want a Georgia that looks more like Georgia and that actually represents and fixes things. And I will pass it to my brother, Reverend Duncan. Um. I'm going to try to do this without a sermon. Um, Shannon, it's good to see you. And you you want to be in a phone bank room with Shannon. It's like, like she could run the machines if they plug them into her. Uh, anyway, um, I just want y'all to imagine that I grew up in a world where when I came out and I went into the gay clubs, they said to me, you look too intense, Duncan. Like you're trying to get married or something. Like it was so antithetical to who we were that the culture within the community didn't accept the possibility, right? So you didn't look at another gay man like you wanted to marry him. And I'm married to my husband now. I want all those things y'all talked about with the cultural shifts that happen in the hearts because of it. Like now people are saying to themselves, oh wow, okay, so we don't we don't need to treat them like that because. It ain't to our benefit or nobody's. It's not helping anybody. And that they believe it on the inside. And some little kid is growing up going, well, yeah, of course I'm gonna get married. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of shift I wanna see. And it happened in my lifetime, and I'm not 100 yet. And don't listen to Nicole. I ain't nowhere near it. <laughs> um, Ada, are you, no, you, who's left? Nicole. 
Oh, Nicole. Oh, she really? threw this out here. We all went? No, no. Lisa. Lisa has not gone. I can't see her face. So you got some dreams for us? There we go. Oh, man. Um, what could I possibly add? I mean, I think just for me right now, um, I'm just so... Um, I think people are coming to know their power mm -hmm. and it's amazing and realizing that we are more powerful than we could even imagine and um i'm also just witnessing a lot of incredible courage and humility as folks who are learning a lot really fast in this moment are interrogating the limits of their own imagination of what is possible and what is necessary and um Hope we just can find moments to celebrate when we do have those wins and take great care of ourselves. And I hope that, um, yeah, we're, we're, uh, there is worth and dignity um, in all of our communities. That vision is so clear and so profound right now. So I'm just, uh, yeah, deeply, deeply hopeful in this moment. Um, and again, interrogating the limits of my imagination. Uh, personally and and with uh, those that I'm I'm on this journey with so Whew. Uh, thank you uh, Lisa and and everyone and um, so what is what is my dream um, I've been doing bits of this type of work um, for a long time lots of different organizations lots of different issues um, but really centered in my mind is just like, like truly, how do we get free? Where, like, what, what does collective uh, liberation both look like as a vision, and what is the, what is the practice that we have to engage in um, to get there? And I think all of our panelists, right, have said um, amazing things, told us how we can get involved, but are really talking about how we aren't just change for change sake, uh, but how we're really trying to imagine a new world and, and fight like hell for it and do the work that we need to do to call it forth. Um, I know a lot of our UUs, right? We like to um, do pray, we like to do um, gratitude lists and all, all of that is important. Um, also the work, right, taking, um, specific action especially right now right we are in um a deep moral crisis in, in our country and we have to do everything we can um to change that one practice that i have been doing um that i think is a really deep communal practice you can do it individually and then talk about it with your friends and this whole idea of imagining a new world is literally like breathe center and actually imagine that new world actually figure what does it look like where is it what's growing there who are the people there what what are they doing in this scene right how how are people being together and then then go to your journal and say this is what it looked like and then ask yourself what is not there what institutions right what actions, what states of being did not actually get included in your vision of collective liberation? And then go like, what may be missing? What, what, do you, what did you forget about that you wanna add to it? And then talk to a friend about it and talk about what does that mean as far as like how you live your life, where you apply your time and talents and how you want to do this work of, you know, you, you the vote and vote love and defeat hate. Uh, we have to have an idea in our mind and then we have to bring our communities together to refine it because you're going to leave something out. We know that happens, right? Um, and, and I really believe that that is the work uh, that we are doing together. And that's why I started this webinar with one of my favorite songs, right? That walking and talking with my mind stayed on freedom. Uh, many years ago in Minneapolis, I got the honor to meet Hollis Watkins, um, a part of the... Um, Mississippi uh, freedom movement and he's always singing that song wherever he goes um, and just talking about literally we have to wake up every morning disciplined and focus on this idea of freedom and that is not only our goal but that is our practice right that is what pulled people and kept the momentum up through many of our movements and I'm just so happy that all of you 
are in this with us, right? Like this is, this is the work and it is sacred. Um, it is strategy <laughs> um, and it can be hard, um, but it is also deeply rewarding. Um, and I can't wait to see uh, the, the new world that we create together. Any questions? You want to get involved? www.uuthevote.org. Sign up for our list um, and, and we'll tell you. And pins on pins on pins. We also got some cute swag coming up. <laughs> so that's happening too. Um, but with that, look at us getting this done on time. <laughs> um, so panelists, you know you have that little outside Zoom link. See you there. But thank you all attendees for joining us. Happy Sunday. Be well. Goodbye. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you.